Good afternoon. Good morning. This is Padraig Otuma giving the lecture Corrymeela, a Ministry of Reconciliation Amidst Fractured Communities in Northern Ireland and Beyond. That was due to be given in Otago University next week, um, in late March 2020. Um, obviously, because of uh, coronavirus, I am heading home to Ireland in order to make sure that I can be back in time. Um, I know that the lecture was going to anyway be put into the context of uh, an online lecture in order to make sure that people can participate and enjoy um, while maintaining um, distance from each other, um, distance socialising or social distance, depending as to how you look at it. Um, distance is important, but socialising continues to be important too. Um, first of all, my um, thanks to Professor David Toombs, who's the Howard Patterson Chair of Theology and Public Issues, and the Director of the Centre for Theology and Public Issues at the University of Otago. Um, and thanks too to Reverend Alistair Lane of St. John's in the City in Wellington. Um, they were the major instigators and sponsors of this visiting scholar programme that brought me to Aotearoa in the first place. And it has been such a pleasure to be here, even though it's been short. And um, Alistair Lane of St. John's in the City, together with Jeff Troughton and Philip Fountain of Victoria University of Wellington, the Religious St Studies Department there, they have provided so many months of support and encouragement and um, their work has supported then what was going to be another glorious week in um, Dunedin and then some other events finishing up in Auckland and uh, it's with deep sadness that these aren't happening but I'm very glad to provide uh, an audio resource that can hopefully be of use. So this lecture, a ministry of reconciliation amidst fractured communities in Northern Ireland and beyond, looking at Corrymeela I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the divisions in the context of the island of Ireland and its relationship with Britain. And then I'm going to speak about some further difficulties in the context of these divisions. I'm going to look a little bit at today's context, speak about the background of Coromila, speak about Coromila's focus in terms of programmes, and then look at the model that Coromila uses through two texts, one text from the Gospel of Mark and one text which is a text of a prayer that's the Coromila Daily Prayer for Courage. So taking both of these, we will um, explore some ways within which Coromila seeks to uh, hold together what might be important when we're bringing people together. It should be said at all costs and in all ways that while I speak of Coromila as the oldest peace and reconciliation centre in Ireland, people have been doing peace and reconciliation in Ireland for a lot, longer, lot longer than there have been centres. And also that so much of peace and reconciliation is done in the context of people not being able to see the full picture, to trying to do the good in the moment. And that comes with, um, ex comes with extraordinary courage and also comes with extraordinary failure and extraordinary levels of not knowing, a deep practice of an agnosticism to say, in the face of not knowing what every good thing that should be done is, I'm going to do what I see to be good right here, right now. And that is open to later years turning back with eyes of suggestion or criticism. And that is understandable, but it doesn't undo the desire that people had and the actions that people took and the bravery that it took to take those actions during times when they couldn't fully see the context within which they were working. It's hard now to look back and to describe absolutely everything that was going on, never mind when you're in the middle of it. So first of all, the divisions. One of the things to look at, obviously, is... 99 years ago, almost 100 years ago, um, this border was drawn across the island of Ireland. Um, in the last number of years during the Brexit project, it's been called the Irish border many times. I don't call it the Irish border. I call it the British border in Ireland. I see the Irish border as being the sea. Um, other people would call it the Irish border. This is part of the problem. What do we name a thing when different people and different groups have different names for a thing? What is the name for this region now created, these two regions now created across different sides of the border? I'm from the very south and I moved to Belfast almost 20 years ago. Um, uh, so formally, these two jurisdictions of Ireland are called the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Ireland is the name for the whole island and the two jurisdictions on it are the Republic of Ireland and the North and Northern Ireland. Some people call Northern Ireland, the North, those would tend to be people who would rather not have a border and would rather not that Northern Ireland was part of the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom. Other people, some people will call the Republic of Ireland, Ireland, and call um, Northern Ireland part of the UK. 
And so depending as to what you call a thing, different people are made to feel like they're at home or they're foreigners. Different people then will also feel like the name for the place, the name for the place, the name for the thing that you call is also a way that you justify who you think was right and obviously who you think was wrong in the context of the last 30, 99, 150 and 200 years of history of British Irish engagement. Different sides see each other as the perpetrator of war or the perpetrators of the justifiers of war, and they justify the responses as the responses to violence. So a question that I regularly have is what the partition of Ireland um, it was done to create, and this is in in history and verifiable, it was done to create a Protestant state for Protestant people. Would that partition be legal today? It's not as easy to say no. I mean, I think some people would like to say so. Um, borders are continuing to be drawn in ways that are benefiting some and not benefiting others today. Certainly when the border was drawn, it was drawn to create um, for a majority of people inside this new border, a border that they would want. And so 70% of Protestant people um, when it, uh, were um, the population then uh, when the Northern Ireland was created in 1921. And 30% people were Catholic. And these terms, Protestant and Catholic, really are openings into the question of whether you think Britain um, has continued right and sovereignty to remain on, uh, in a corner of Ireland or not. And so to really we're speaking about um, political and social and power-based relationships and realities through these monikers, Catholic and Protestant, rather than questions about um, theological difference. Given that the history of the question about um, the entire of the relationship of Ireland's, uh, the, the entire of the population's relationship of Ireland with the population of Britain, given that that goes back so long, how do we do something today that's beneficial? How do we understand what can be good? And I think this is one of the things that the Ministry of Corrymeela and the Ministry of Reconciliation has so importantly done. There is so much to learn, but learning 700 years of history um, will not tell you what to do today. What we must do today is always going to be based on the risk of courage, the risk of seeking to find relationship in ways that are new, seeking to say surprising things to people who are, who are on the different political um, point of view than we might be. There are some further difficulties that we find within the context of these um, dialogues and these negotiations when it comes to British-Irish relationships and the ongoing impact. Obviously, um, the border was created in 1922. Um, there was, uh, this was at, just at the end of World War I. Um, there was a civil war in Ireland um, shortly after that. Some people uh, accepted the idea of a temporary compromise of a British border being drawn across the island of Ireland. Other people didn't. And there was a civil war in the Republic of Ireland um, in the 1920s. Um, it is verifiable that there was um, various forms of gerrymandering um, meaning that Catholics found it difficult or were indeed um, incapable of getting public office or high high role, um, particularly high role in terms of government or, or policing um, for many, many years. This all built in great tension in the 60s when civil rights marches were happening all across the world. Civil rights marches, um, mostly to do with um, working class workers, happened um, were beginning to happen all across Belfast and Derry and other places. It's important to note that these civil rights marches, particularly focusing on the needs of workers and the rights of workers, had many participants on it who identified both with Catholic and with Protestant identities. And um, that's a really important thing to remember. There was a, a growing movement of people who were dissatisfied with a government that was supporting itself um, and supporting those that it favoured. Meanwhile, a large working class group of people were being disenfranchised and marginalised and alienated. This um, was a grassroots movement. There are phenomenal leaders from that who deserve their own um, entire courses at university and their uh, to be studied. Um, and what happened after that was in the night in 1968, um, uh, some riots began breaking out, and those civil rights marches um, were manipulated into violence. And um, 68, 69 for 30 years, that period of time is is the latest period of time that's called the Troubles. The Troubles is a term that's used regularly to describe periods when the tensions between Britain and Ireland, particularly in the North, although not exclusively, um, rose to the point of um, violence. 
again, even that is a complicated context. How do you describe violence? Is violence only when a group of people respond back to something that a state is doing? What about when a language became less and less legal to speak the Irish language? How do we describe that in terms of violence? The question as to who is to blame um, infects everything when it comes to speaking about places that have long-standing, deeply complex, overlapping violences and overlapping narratives. And so I think it's always important to recognise that um, what's really needed is to understand that blame can go in all directions. Even the people that you agree with, we must still, especially if you agree with them, hold them to the light of accountability and integrity, recognising um, where blame must go there. This I'm speaking, I'm not saying that this is a template for every part of the world, but I am saying that this is a template for the question of the relationship of Britain and Ireland. Um, in as much as I'm a, an enormous um, crit uh, uh, criticizer of the question of empire, I um, also feel it incumbent upon me to look at the practice of the of Irishness through um, various attempts to seek um, independence for Ireland and want to hold the light of accountability to that. In order to hold accountability to the Irishness that I want to um, hope that I can be part of. In light of everything, so this, these troubles went from 68 to 98, 3,600 people were murdered, um, uh, 80,000 people were injured, 500,000 or so were directly affected by grief, um, and that's in a population in the north of what wasn't then yet 1.5 million. So that's a, a vast population of people in a small population, vast proportion of people in a small population. Um, there, Claire Mitchell, the Belfast-based sociologist, speaks the, about Northern Ireland being um, a meta-conflict because there's conflict about what the conflict is about. Some people say everything was grand up until 1968. Other people will say nothing was grand as a result of the creation of the Union in 1801 and partition in 1921. People will say that those things were the beginning of violence to which any response was just a response to violence. There's difficulty, too, in recognising that there's a link between religion and political affiliation and cultural affiliation and that questions to do with um, class and money and um, association are all overlapping enormously. Once I heard a lecture saying that there were 13 different overlapping sociological dynamics that went in, uh, religion being one, as well as many other fa features, language, of course, being another. The the troubles, the latest version of the troubles, nineteen sixty eight to nineteen ninety eight, was also influenced by inf international diaspora communities of Irish people and British people. Um, it seems to be true to say that diaspora communities can um, f have a hope that the 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 country they left will stay the way they left it. And so it is certainly true that many Irish Americans gave monies that were initially going into purchasing arms for to um, continue the arms um, continue the armed conflict. And uh, that's, that's true for um, people of other identities from Northern Ireland who were overseas too. Monies were being sent back to support whatever side they wished because there were paramilitaries on many sides. Similarly, though, um, eventually, international diaspora communities of um, Irish, Scots-Irish, British-Irish, um, Northern Irish, UK people overseas also did contribute enormously to the question of um, international support as the peace process, as it finally landed into, um, arrived in the late 90s. One of the things that happens over and over um, in Belfast is um, people uh, speaking about two communities as if it is as simple as two communities. And there are communities, uh, neighbourhoods, I suppose I mean in specific, all across Belfast and Derry and Newry and Armagh and many other um, towns and cities and many other rural places who live with the ongoing impact of a lack of a sustained model of social engagement um, by the government. Government policy has, like in many places, Northern Ireland isn't unique in this, been about keeping people voting for you, which has sometimes meant keeping people angry by stirring up anger rather than being about a long-term multi-party, multi-sector engagement, knowing that this will cross, will, will stretch across multi-sittings of multi-different arrangements of coalition governments. Um, instead of which there tends to be quick changes um, and quick changes of government and then quick changes in policy rather than saying, look, we're facing into 70 or 80 years here where we're really trying to normalize and stabilize something of what this community is going to be like together. 
and um, in short term views will never provide and short term periods of government and four years is short term when you're thinking of dealing with something which you can I mean I think to be, to be generous you could say we're dealing with a hundred years since partition I think the, the troubles go back a lot further than that but just to be I think modest and generous let's just say it's a hundred years you probably need about a hundred years of um, ongoing um, sustained coordinated improvements um, and recognizing that anything that's done will not be the final word but just the latest step <coughs> That is a difficulty because typically governments want to say, no, we've achieved reconciliation, we've moved on, they want to attract economy and industry. The Ministry of Reconciliation can sometimes be seen um, through a suspicious light by certain government um, projects because to acknowledge the need for reconciliation is to acknowledge a problem. And that is really important. Reconciliation can seem like a soft word, but other people will say, reconciliation, why? Like, what what's what needs to be reconciled? Am I a threat? And that I understand can be um awkward if you're trying to attract industry and tourism there, and it's a safe place to 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 come. But nonetheless, some of the deep tensions do go very deep, and um certain parts of certain communities continue to um exist uh, in tensions. Um, where they manifest to the wider society some of the tensions that the wider society has sometimes doesn't even face up to. I think I'm going to speak, this whole um, lecture really is from my own point of view. I used to be the leader of the Carmilla community until 2019. I finished that. I'm still a member, but I'm speaking 100% on my own behalf. There has been a deep ambivalence about the Good Friday Agreement and some of the parties that are now ruling. Um, the DUP did not vote for it. And it has certainly not been um, something that they have spoken much about in the last number of years since the Brexit project has been underway. And it, there also has been a deep lack of knowledge in political parties in Westminster, particularly in my estimation in the most recent group of prime ministers, about the contents and impacts and dedications of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement is really worthwhile reading. Take half an hour to read it. You'll find it on the British and Irish um, governmental websites. Good Friday Agreement or Belfast Agreement. People call it different things. As a piece of silliness, sometimes Catholics, you can say Catholics call it the Good Friday Agreement. Protestants call it the um, Belfast Agreement. I don't care what people call it. If it needs two names, if it needs three, needs three, if it needs five, who cares? The contents of it are spectacular. It isn't perfect, uh, but it wasn't seeking to be perfect. It was seeking to be appropriate for the moment then. And I think it still has an enormous amount to give. Um, the landmark thing in it is that both the Irish and the British governments um, gave up constitutional claim to land in the north. And so um, the Irish government, uh, the Irish constitution, it's a written constitution um, for the Republic of Ireland, had always made constitutional claim about the territory called Northern Ireland by the British, typically called the North when you're speaking in the South. Um, in the Good Friday Agreement, that um, meant that the people, North and South of Ireland, voted for um, the uh, voted for a change in the Irish constitution that uh, no longer is their constitutional territorial claim. And then the British Acts of Parliament were amended too. The Crown no longer holds sovereignty over um, Northern Ireland. That is a fundamental and serious change introduced into the um, British Acts of Parliament. I, half the time, I don't think people in Britain know this. Um, the sovereignty of, of the island of Ireland is given to the people of Ireland to vote about it. The Good Friday Agreement recognises that this is actually inappropriate for government, a, a sitting government for three or four or five years or however long they're in to make a decision on that. This is for the people of Ireland to decide for ourselves when we're ready. And this is a phenomenal achievement to arrive at. Governments writing policy, recognising that governments are not the one to make a serious decision like that, but that a process will need to be put in, and that process is outlined in the Good Friday Agreement. So these the lack of knowledge of the brilliance of this from some of the most recent sitting British Prime Ministers has really complicated them when it comes to them talking about what it is that they have signed up according to international law and treaty to providing for um, Ireland, North and South. Um, and I think the lack of knowledge in some of the Tory Prime Ministers has certainly complicated public discussion about um, Britain's um, legal commitments to the question of Ireland. Today, and all across the North, um, these uh, the dynamics that I can describe now if, uh, regarding Belfast, regarding other cities, regarding rural places too, in the North of Ireland, 
Um, some of these dynamics are just very similar to um, lots of other cities, disparity between socioeconomic groups, um, moving away from industry and um, communities that once had very proud, strong, working um, commitments from industry to them and back from them. Um, those communities um, feeling overlooked and feeling um, left out and feeling angry. Um, there is less religious attendance and there are new arriving populations and there's increased community differences in some places. And um, the peace agenda, so-called, is sometimes moving to an inclusion agenda and some fe people might feel like that the, the inclusion agenda might um, leave them behind. Some are feeling forgotten and so noise is made sometimes by people who feel forgotten. And Brexit, of course, introduces complication to all of this. I think this is my my opinion. I think there was never uh, an imagination that Brexit was going to go through. And suddenly when Brexit did go through, an enormous amount of questions had to be asked, which to my mind should have been asked in advance. And so this can lead, um, some people call it um, in Northern Ireland a benign apartheid. That there are communities of people who mix well, there are communities of people who, for all kinds of circumstances, not because of personal prejudice, but all kinds of circumstances, um, rarely mix with each other, may maybe rarely see each other because of schooling. Typically, um, there's a Catholic-maintained sector of schooling, there's a state-maintained sector of schooling, which tends to be predominantly Protestant, and then there is um, an Irish language sector, and there's an integrated sector. It's about 8% of the population of school going young people go to integrated schooling um, and integrated schooling will set a quota for Catholic, Protestant and other um, people in terms of the population of the school according to the demographics of the area. That isn't to say however that um, people going to state schools only meet Protestants or people going to Catholic schools only meet Catholics and um, plenty of the schools that are affiliated to a sector that tends to be assumed to be of one kind of religious attendance um, or re religious affiliation, plenty of those sectors are really, really mixed also. And so the schooling sector can um, is more subtle than it seems, but also um, needs some serious reform. But it can be really difficult to know when you are dealing with multi-sector schools how to how to go about that. The Irish language is not given. Um, it, it is recently given some protection in the most recent um agreements that have reset our local government stormant um, in meeting. Uh, so the Irish language sector is tiny in terms of schooling. So, um, but that bank sector too is uh, filled with people who are not necessarily Catholic. And so it is a, a really interesting um, sector. Corimila, um, to give you a little bit of background about Corimila, I always think of Corrymeela beginning in Dresden. Ray Davy was a Presbyterian a minister who had volunteered as a padre with the YMCA in World War II. He was um, volunteering uh, in a um, respite camp in North Africa, and that, that camp was taken over, and he was taken prisoner. And he was moved throughout prisoner war camps initially in Italy and then up, in, up into Germany, finishing in 40, end of 44, 1945 in Dresden. Um, and there uh, he he had some freedom of movements because being a padre, he was able to move from the camp, which is a bit outside Dresden, sometimes into the city. Um, if there was, for instance, an allied soldier who was going to die, um, he would have been given leave to go and administer the last rites to walk the many miles in and many miles out. Um, he had gotten to know along the way many residents in Dresden who were very sympathetic to him. And so when, in February 1945, um, the, the bombing of Dresden happened, a bombing that's just noted recently, it's um, 75th marking, um, and that city lost 25,000 citizens in two nights. Um, Ray Davy was freed and disturbed uh, both. He saw the freedom of him and his compatriots, for which, of course, that's what they deserved. He saw that that came at the cost of lives, at the, at the practice of annihilation, and wondered, does annihilation always have to happen in order for certain populations to be made free? He came back to Ireland, and Ireland by that stage, 1945, had not yet even been 25 years partitioned. He came back to Belfast, and um, he began working as a chaplain in Queen's University in Belfast. And working there, he began to see amongst younger populations and the way that these new divisions, Britishness, Irishness, Catholic, Protestant, Unionist, Nationalist, the way that these different divisions were being worked out. And he was anxious to make sure that there could be 
a, a wider mindset and that could, there could be the capacity for people across religious and political, social and national identification understandings to engage with each other. So he, for many years, had open table around the house and invited many people to his home and took pilgrimages across different parts of Europe that were setting up similar projects to try to respond to what the hell has just happened and how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again. So this is what he did for those 20 years. In 1965, he heard of um, a piece of land being um, put up for sale, a piece of land just outside the village of Valley Castle, 50 miles north of Belfast. The piece of land ha was owned by the Evangelical Holiday Fellowship and there was a house on it, a bit ramshackle, but usable with a bit of tender care. And so with it seems there was a group of people who had been meeting wondering about setting up some kind of community. Some people wanted it to be city based. Some people wanted it to have an outside center somewhere outside the city. There were various groups of people involved in that. Plenty of students, plenty of older people, too. There were various groups of people also um, and various different individuals who were thinking that they would like some role of leadership within the context whenever this community of whatever kind it was going to be was going to be set up. This wasn't a unique occurrence. All across Europe, these um, different kinds of communities were being set up. It was the 60s, and um, in Germany, lots of these communities had already been going for 10, 15 years. They were called ecumen ecumenical institutes, and Ray, because of his connections that he had maintained with Dresden, was familiar with those ecumenical institutes and had brought many students from Queen's to visit some of those ecumenical institutes. In Scotland, the Iona community had been set up by George MacLeod and Ray and George were friends. And so there was models of faith-infused communities that were politically attentive and asking public questions um, happening already all across Europe. And Ray, Ray was seeking to find something of a model that was appropriate to Ireland. I think really that um, the, the centre that David Toombs leads in Otago, Centre for Theology and Public Issues, uh, Public Theology and Public Issues, is... Um, a really uh, similar model to what in the 60s people were seeking to do um, somewhere that's full of learning and somewhere also that's f mixing learning with practical application and recognizing that the best kind of learning happens within a group, diverse group of people who have the confidence to speak with each other and learn from each other and argue very seriously and continue to disagree, but perhaps to find a new and different way of disagreeing, a way that can be more creative. That doesn't take away tension. It doesn't even take away anger, but it, it seeks to take away um, aggression and threat. So... 1965 is when this piece of land was bought. Ray um, had seen it. They raised some money quickly, borrowed the rest, and this piece of land, 50 miles north of Belfast, was purchased. And um, Desney Cromie was the first person to be sent up. Um, Desney Cromie was the assistant chaplain in Queens at the time. And Ray apparently gave her the keys and said, head on up to that place. And she said, what am I supposed to do? And he said, go and see what needs to be done. And that is a phrase that has um, really encapsulated much about what Cormier is about. Cormier isn't necessarily a place that is about abstractions, but is a place that is about action. And she went up and that was the beginning of Cormier, really. And since then, you can say that kind of upwards to about 10,000 people a year have engaged in programs to do with peace and reconciliation, to do with dialogue, to do with inclusion, to do with social marginalization, to do with faith and politics and doubt. Um, over that time. The Cormilla community is not a residential community. Um, the members of the Cormilla community don't live um, on site. There is a group of people who do live on site that changes um, kind of on a monthly, weekly, yearly basis. There's a volunteer program. There's people who come for two weeks or sometimes up to two years. Mostly when volunteers come, they come for 12 months. Um, there's staff as well. And the community uh, primarily live in Ballycastle, and in Belfast, each in their own homes and in their own jobs and in their own lives, where people make yearly commitments to incorporate Corimila and reconciliation into their everyday actions and into their commitments. People give time and money to the Corimila, to the work of the site and the centre, and um, then are giving a lot of time to support the governance and fundraising um, roles of the, of the work that happens through the extraordinary staff and volunteers. Loads of Corimila members are up on a very regular basis and um, providing vital services up on the site also. All this happened in 1965. 
the, <clears throat> the community was called Corrymeela because somebody said, what's the name of these few fields? Every few fields in Ireland has a name on the Ordnance Survey maps. And apparently some, it, it, the name is Corrymeela. And so they said, well, let's call it the Corrymeela community. At the time, the name was uh, obscure. Nobody seemed to know what it meant. Somebody suggested it meant Hill of Harmony, and that stuck for a while. But I don't know where that came from. Um, the troubles hadn't quite broken out yet. Tensions were high. They didn't break out till 68, 69. Um, apparently in the 70s, an etymologist of old Irish came and said it definitely doesn't mean Hill of Harmony. It means something like a lumpy crossing place, lumpy crossing place. It may be because the land is um, it's good, it's a headland, but it's not great for farming. Maybe because you're looking out to the complicated and rough and deeply current laden sea between um, uh, Valley Castle and the Mullock Tyre over in Scotland. And I think it's 14 miles across at its closest point. But there aren't swimming competitions or anything like that, and the currents are dangerous there. So maybe that's the lumpy crossing place. Either way, it's an appropriate term for what reconciliation can be. And by six, by sixty eight, the troubles had broken out, and suddenly Coromila found itself where um it had been attending um to the real needs that were already going, was suddenly attending to real needs plus a deep crisis with increased murders happening. The early seventies were terrible years. There were horrific murders, um, all kinds of people murdered, injured, put out of their homes. Corrymeela was regularly used as a site where people who were threatened um, and had to leave their homes with great haste would be able to stay. Um, uh, in the 70s, Corrymeela began to employ people. Uh, up, to, up until then, it had been run only um, uh, through volunteers. And up until the 70s, too, uh, the membership was only for Presbyterians. And that wasn't, and I think that's an important thing to recognize and to recognize with great subtlety because initially it was seeking to be a Presbyterian society working within the broader Presbyterian Church of Ireland to, to influence and change that. It, there was plenty of Catholic friends and that was considered a rad radical thing. But in the 70s, it became clear that the broader group of the church, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, were going elsewhere. Um, they were seeking to remove themselves from the War Council of Churches because of the um, increased public discussion in the World Council of Churches about ordination of women. And so um, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland did. It joined the World Council of Reformed Churches and then Coromila formally changed itself to becoming an ecumenical community with full membership for any people coming from Christian practices. Um, and uh, this has continued in terms of employment. Um, there has been, uh, well, there was a, a youth worker employed in the 70s and then some more youth workers and program workers. And then uh, the, the first person to be employed was a, was the cook. And um, then now Corrymeela has about 30 staff and regularly will have maybe 12 to 14 um, long-term volunteers and then many other um, short-term volunteers who might be there for um, a few weeks. And then there's people who are almost permanent volunteers, people who live locally, who give an hour a day, two days, three days a week um, for decades in terms of supporting the work that goes on. On an everyday basis these days in Corrymeela, there can be um, groupings of young people coming in from schools to do school programs. There can be groupings of teachers coming to have consultations about perhaps how to design history curricula in a way that brings people from different historical um, perspectives together in order to understand each other's um, beginning points and ending points and hoping points through history and uh, analysing the present. There might be groups of people who are marginalised because of um, sexual orientation or race or um, disability up there exploring what it might look to be part of a reconciled society. Um, so there can be all kinds of groupings of people up there at the same time. Um, Coromila is a religious community and um, Christianity is the mother tongue really of the founders and has always, and this is a really important thing to say, has always recognised that um, bringing people who have a deep devotion together with people who have a deep doubt, but they are joined by a, a rich desire to participate together in action, bringing those groups of people together is important. Not everybody needs to share the language of devotion. Um, in order to be able to share a language of um, action. And so while Christianity is the mother tongue, the table is wide and there's always space. And I think that's um, a great practice. From my point of view, um, I think that interreligious dialogue is best practiced when people have a mother tongue and then can speak widely with each other. <coughs> I think um, to pretend that to, sometimes people will say, oh, let's just remove kind of references to Christianity and just speak broadly about spirituality when it comes to Corrymeela. 
Ireland has been so steeped in Christianity for so many hundreds of years, and Coromila certainly grew out of that in all the pains and devastations of that, as well as the gifts that Christianity can bring. And I think to, to maintain the specificity and the particularity of working from a religious tradition in order to be able to speak to that religious tradition on an ongoing basis and to be open within the context of that is an honesty that we can participate in. It has been with great joy when we've had um, Muslim volunteers and Jewish volunteers, Hindu volunteers, volunteers who are atheists, volunteers who are humanist, um, come and lead morning or evening prayers for us in a way that feels appropriate to them. And the um the 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 chapel space at Coromila, well we don't call it that, we call it the Cree, which is the Irish word for heart. That place has been um a place of deep engagement. It's a circular building where people are facing each other as they're sitting down. There's a candle, a cross, and an open Bible there, designed as a way of rep representing the earth of Ireland. The cross is made out of turf, and um, the candle is to remind us about um, light and darkness, and that both are created by God, and that we're uh, sometimes living in one and sometimes living in the other. And then the open book is an open book of our complicities, as well as our hope. And rather than an open book to say everybody needs to believe the same thing about how to read and interpret this book. Carmilla's focus in terms of our public programs um, are categorised into four. Um, the first of these is sectarianism. It's a word that is um, used in certain societies, but it's a word that can be used in all. Sectarianism has de been defined by Cecilia, Lichtig, uh, Cecilia, Lichting, Cecilia Clegg and Joe Lichty as um, belonging gone bad. And I love their definition because it recognises that um, sectarianism begins in belonging. We do wish to belong. And the question is, is what's the quality of our belonging? Do we make our borders porous? Are they difficult to enter and hard to leave? Are they difficult to leave? Uh, are they difficult to enter? How is it that we go about understanding the quality of our borders? Second, um, and then obviously looking at the, the projects that are run through sectarianism, work with groupings of young people, groupings of people in um, security services, groupings of people in education, looking at um, the impact of sectarianism in the here and now and how to combat it and how to work together with it for more creative out, um, outputs. The Legacies of Conflict program is the second. The Legacies of Conflict program particularly works with the education sister, system in post-primary and in tertiary education, designing curricula, training teachers, working with academics to look into research projects that show a more subtle reading of the past, um, and also designing curricula that help teachers be supported in, in addressing more recent events in Irish history. Um, typically, many teachers might feel uncomfortable addressing questions to do with um, more recent political history in Ireland with pupils. Um, and that isn't uh, easily categorizable as cowardice because they, they might very rightly say, I don't know who's in my class in terms of who will say, that's my uncle you're talking about or my aunt or my grandmother. Um, somebody who's being deemed, um, who, whose victim story is being explored, somebody who's being deemed as a great, um, as a great perpetrator of something terrible. Um, depending as to how the class are going to speak about that, um, and the, if somebody does or does disclose that that was a member of their fa recent family, then um, that can be very complicated. So the Legacies of Conflict program works in that context, supporting teachers coming up with curricula and giving people the confidence to do that. Working also with the universities who provide training to teachers of history, particularly. Um, uh, Coromila is one of two organisations that provides uh, major ongoing professional development resources for teachers of history in Northern Ireland. The third focus is marginalisation. This is marginalisation that isn't just about working with people who feel marginalised, but also giving people tools to analyse the technologies of marginalisation. What's the system at the heart of marginalisation? And how can we understand that system and then look today to realise who is being marginalised and what's the system that's benefiting from that while people who are being marginalised are being systematically underbenefited? And then the fourth part is um, public theology. And public theology is Coromila's ongoing commitment to providing resources and experiences of faith to explore theology and explore the practice of faith um, through ways that continue to say there are moral questions to be asked in the everyday about the link between faith and violence and the way that faith um, can be used to um, move us further from violence rather than deepen us in stereotyping of the other. We have a youth work department as well, youth worker department um, as well, because so much of the work happens with young people. And so um, many times a, a youth group or we work together with the education authority in um, informal education. And so 
so much learning happens amongst young people in informal settings. And so uh, the youth worker and designs programs of extraordinary sophistication, bringing young people together. He has currently been doing some fantastic programs um, looking at podcasting and bringing young people together from various parts of the community, um, working in um, deepening their skills base. But then obviously they're needing to come up with programs to make in order to practice their skills. So programs to explore. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Interviewing, splicing, editing and learning about the, the values underneath all of those things. Um, and how do I edit somebody else when it's something I don't know or something I don't like? Um, so uh, finding technologies where young people are coming away with new skills, but also coming away with new understandings of each other is an important thing. As I move towards the end, I'm keen to explore the model of Corimila through two texts, the first of which is a text from Mark's Gospel. In Mark's Gospel, um, Jesus of Nazareth is walking along with the disciples. And um, were I in the room, I would ask to see if we could recreate that text by people calling it out. So I'm going to do that now. Um, in Corimila and in many other places too, I, um, I see people saying, let's see if we know that text. Because it's always interesting, rather than reading a text, and we can go into a certain kind of zombie mode sometimes when reading a received text, it's always interesting to hear the text be recreated in the room by people recalling whatever fragmentary recollections they have of the text. So it might be something that you want to do to think about that. Jesus and his disciples are walking um, on the way to Capernaum, which in Mark's Gospel is considered where maybe where Jesus lived. And it says when they get to the house, he um, turns to them and he says, what were you arguing about along the way? But they were silent um, because they've been arguing about who was the greatest. And then he asks them to sit down and then he um, calls a little child to them and uh, he embraces the child and says to them, whoever welcomes um, one of these, welcomes one of, a person like this, welcomes me and whoever welcomes me, welcomes my father. This is a really interesting text because I think this isn't a text that was used as a template for Corimila's models of conversation, but it is a text that is used, that I think can be used as an analysis of Corimila's engagements. To think about the text in general, what were you arguing about along the way? When you look at that in Irish, it says, What was happening between you along the way? And I love that. Um, I love that uh, description of what was happening between you. He's inviting them to pay attention to the dynamics of community dynamics between them. And then in Irish it says, there was no word from them. They were ashamed. And I think it's a really interesting thing to notice that what we have here is a person, a trusted person, asking people to say, look, there's clearly a dynamic here that A, you're talking about, but you're not talking about talking about it. And I want us to do that. And regularly, that is the Ministry of Reconciliation. It's not like stuff is not being talked about, but we're not talking about the way we're talking about it. We're allowing things to have their own and um, perhaps dangerous dynamism and allowing things to escalate or be avoided for a while and go up and down rather than saying, what is our practice? Do we have some rules, um, group rules, community rules, pop up rules even about the way that we talk about these things? In Greek, the language in which Mark's Gospel was written, the word dialogism is rendered as argument here. Obviously, it's the way word place we get the word dialogue from in English. It's an interesting question, too, to think of in the Gospel text. What were you arguing about along the way? And they're saying, well, you know, they've been arguing about who the greatest was. What would the measurement of greatness have been? Would it have been who got to spend most time with Jesus? Would it have been who got the most praise from him? And I like that question, what would the measurement of greatness have been, because it happens so often. In the peace industry, for instance, who do we, how do we decide if we're working in the peace industry or public theology or social issues industry or social healing industry? How do we decide who we think is great and who not? Is it about who has the most followers on Instagram? Is it about who got the most recent mention from a famous person? Is it about who got the funding? What is our measurement of greatness? Is it about who can be um, provide the longest contract? Is it about who writes the fanciest um, impact statements? Is it about what is it about? How do we um, reflect on um, the way that we measure greatness? Are those um, terms set by funders? Are they set collaboratively? And these profound tensions open up um, the question of our relationship to power. 
And this is something I did half of a PhD, not even half, um, with David Toombs um, years ago when he was working in um, Belfast um, through the Trinity College Dublin's um, location in Belfast. And regularly David was pointing me to see over and over again the deep interest that Jesus of Nazareth has and that the gospel writers have in power dynamics. And noticing here that power dynamics were splitting a small group of people, a small group of people who apparently were like minded for the most part in terms of following along with Jesus and making adjustments to their lives and seeing that and um, paying particular attention to power dynamics in small groups will help us give the tools to pay particular um, attention to the power dynamics in large groups and political groups and interpolitical groups and religious leadership and industry leadership and paramilitary leadership in groups of people who advocate violence and groups of people who advocate peace finding ways to have tools to, to open up that david toombs began to david began to give me tools for looking at the linguistic um, features of the gospels that then can be unpicked and so while he didn't give me this insight i think, think it came from the little bit of him that he left in me the interesting thing that Jesus does is that he brings a child and sets the child among them. The, the delicious part of this text is that it doesn't say where the child came from or who the child was. It might have been Jesus' child or a nephew or a neighbour. Who knows? There was a child in the house, apparently, on the, on the shelf of children. Jesus plucked the child down, put it among them and embraced the child and then said to them, Look, you know, those who welcome this one um, welcome me. And I think that is a really interesting thing and it speaks in favour of a um, embodied, subjective, incarnational response to things that are abstract. And I think that is really important. Sometimes people can be really critical of the human dynamic response to responding to big political dynamics like Northern Ireland. And Corrie Mila um, isn't seeking to be the everything, but human dynamics and human relations and transforming division through human encounter is a really important part of um, what, what Coromila does. And that isn't just for youth group to youth group or church group to church group. Because when you see political systems where people are unpracticed in the art of human encounter, well then that really does get in the way of the capacity of political negotiations to do policy work. Human encounter is glue that's needed at community level as well as at governmental and policy level, at educational senior executive level, at all kinds of levels. And so I love that Jesus has an embodied response to something that was abstract. He made them look at the person who represented the exact opposite of the thing that they were so um, fascinated by and ashamed to talk about. And that is the confrontational nature of the work of reconciliation. The other text that I'd like to explore is the text, um, The Prayer for Courage. I wrote this just as I came into the leadership of Corimela. Um, Corimela has a loose invitation to the 170 members to say the prayer, to say prayers for each other. We have different members' names each day of the month um, to have a text to reflect on an intention or two, an action of um, uh, care for the earth. And then I wrote this prayer for courage for people to think about. I mean, the, the whole prayer morning thing would probably take about two or three minutes. You know, it's a short thing. We're not a particularly holy community. Um, here's the prayer for courage. Courage comes from the heart and we are always welcomed by God, the tree of all being. We bear witness to our faith, knowing that we are called to live lives of courage, love and reconciliation in the ordinary and extraordinary moments of each day. We bear witness to, to our failures and our complicity in the fractures of our world. May we be courageous today. May we learn today. May we love today. This text for me was um, writing something as I came into the leadership of Corimela in 2014, writing something that could speak to the way of paying attention to reconciliation in the here and now, reconciliation about the ongoing nature of um, sectarian divisions in Northern Ireland, reconciliation about the ongoing nature in the human condition uh, regarding racism, regarding misogyny, regarding disability, regarding um, sexual orientation and gender. Um, courage comes from the heart. The word Cree is the Irish word for heart. Um, and uh, the Cree is an important word for Coromila because it's the place of our, our chapel meeting space. But there's an etymological phrase in this too, courage, from Latin core, meaning heart. So courage does come from the heart. And for us, courage and welcome are some of the primary technologies and economies that we think are important 
um, together with hospitality in the space of responding to um, places that can regularly trade in the practice of hostility, to think that in the face of hostility, we can practice hospitality and courage and the heart. And this is, and this is a really important thing. The next, we bear witness to our faith, knowing that we are called to live lives of courage, love and reconciliation. Um, making the link immediately from faith into action is an important part of that text. And I think that is part of the model and ministry of, um, of Corrie Miller's understanding of reconciliation. In the ordinary and extraordinary moments of each day, the um, capacity for us to do extraordinary things in extraordinary moments, I think, will always be nurtured by small moments of practice and attentiveness to um, the ordinary moments in ordinary days. And then this most important line, we bear witness to, to our failures and our complicity in the fractures of our world. One of the things that I have loved about Corimila, and nobody in Corimila has ever claimed that it's perfect, it's filled with imperfections, filled with hurt, filled with people who joined hoping it for be, to be one thing and were disappointed and either stayed or left, and both of those choices can be choices of great virtue. And there was some division at the start when Ray Davy was the leader and the, set, the site was chosen to be 50 miles north. There had been other people who had had thoughts of leadership and who also had had thoughts of it being more urban centred. And so, um, yeah, there were even at the beginning of it, there were some people that thought, oh, we've been working for years towards something and the shape that it's landed in is not the shape that I wanted. So therefore, it's not for me. There have been people who have worked for Carmela, who have loved the work and have come away feeling like I've loved the work, but I don't felt didn't feel like I was paid enough or supported enough. Um, and this is true and it can be difficult to do good. And that isn't an excuse, uh, but it is a recognition and a confession. Carmela is uninterested in standing outside the practices and observances of um, sectarianism and diagnosing them by pointing at them, but is really interested in standing inside and confessing and uh, and then doing what we can to change that probably for those people who are hurt by the way that Carmela has not served them is not enough um, but certainly for me as somebody who's been in leadership somebody who has at times been hurt by Carmela and somebody who has at times also been the one where people would say yeah he hurt um, me by the way that the choices were being made what during my tenure as leader um, I think that the ongoing capacity for where people will point out your failings, and that has certainly happened on a regular basis, um, as well as the openness for people to hear when somebody wants to say to them, look, I have something to say that's important and I have felt scapegoated and I, have, I, I want to say this. Sometimes this can happen quickly. Sometimes this might happen after years. When I became, I think these are important things and this is one of the things that keeps me there. Um, when I became leader, I... Um, spent the first year hearing stories of people who were in their early 70s who'd been hurt by something that had happened in Corimila 25 years previously when they were people in their 40s. Um, they, are, they were then in the 40s, mid 40s, the age that I am now. And I um, found myself realizing, gosh, how long sometimes it can take to come to language about a hurt. And that isn't to say you should have come to it earlier. Sometimes we can't have come there because time wasn't available or the relationships weren't available or other things got in the way. And so we bear witness to our failures and our complicity in the fractures of our world. And then the prayer for courage finishes on may we be courageous today, may we learn today, may we love today. And courage, learning and love. The recognition of learning inside there is important for me because learn implies we, we're saying we're going to learn things that we didn't know. and We didn't know we didn't know. And so that there always needs to be a posture of learning from everybody new. Coramila up at the site creates temporary community experiences for people who come there, a group of people for a weekend, a group of people who are volunteering for two weeks or for 12 months, temporary learning experiences as the people, the participants, they live in community uh, for that short period of time of a year, the, um, the staff, the outside facilitators coming in, the community members, the long-term community members of Coramela who might be up volunteering there, all of those participations are filled with the possibility of learning from each other. That can be lumpy, of course, we know that well, um, when you put people together who are deeply committed to something and who have lots of ideas together about what that might look like. But to be in reconciliation together is to see the way that most learning comes at awkward moments. If all life learning came in moments where we were prepared for it, then that would be particularly you know smooth but it's not we're in a lumpy life so i want to finish by um thanking you for your your attention thanking once again david toombs um for the invitation to give 
this as well as his years of influencing me in terms of having tools and um, uh, spectacles through which to explore dynamics of power and to step in and out of those dynamics of power and to wish you very well as you consider what the shape of a ministry of reconciliation amidst fractured communities uh, might look like in the context of your own work.